It never ceases to amaze me. Every time I get up here, my bladder decides to try and evacuate itself. Oh, oh, he must be having a moment with the Lord. I'm just like, glass half full though. If it happens, I get to hide behind here. So if I don't leave, you know why. <laughs> you know, have you ever come across something that just sticks with you? Whether it's, you know, a good piece of literature or good conversation. Or in my case, more often than not, a really great meme on Facebook. Something that just makes you laugh and then they, uh, you, you think you post it, you're being funny and other people look at you funny or whatever. But just something that sticks with you. And it was funny, I was thinking about Christmas even in the summertime because I think that in life there's seasons. You know, when I was a kid I got so excited for Christmas because it's just so stimulating and there's so much happening and your family and your friends are coming together and obviously you get presents and toys and things you want. That doesn't hurt. And let's be honest, even as adults that doesn't hurt. You can throw an amen out there if you really want to. <laughs> Preach it, amen, that's the gospel, you know. But there's, it's funny now, being a father and having uh, Bex at an age where she's more into it, I'm getting more excited to the point of being, I think almost a little foolish at times. I'm wearing a Santa hat on Sunday morning and Christmas Eve for crying out loud. You know, in other, in other churches, I don't want to pick on anyone, but other churches, I would be railroaded out the front door or the back door, depending on how much of an atrocity it was. But... Anyway, my point, uh, John Ortberg had this material called, Who Was This Man? And I was reading over it and I was soaking in it, I thought, you know what, I really have to borderline plagiarize all this stuff and preach it at Christmas. So, for the record, this is not my stuff, this is going to be a bit of a different take. This is all information that's been collected, gathered, and orchestrated by John Ortberg. So if you really want to look into it deeper, Google him, YouTube him, okay? But this is interesting, because we're in the Christmas season, the celebration of Jesus coming as a baby boy. Growing up, living life, dying the death, resurrecting to new life. So, we have to ask the question, who was this man? Imagine for a second that history has been divided into two parts, before and after he Look at our calendar. For the longest time, it was B.C., A.D., before Christ and after death. I mean, that says something. Who is this man? Why is there a San Francisco? John Ortberg hails from California. Well, because Francis of Assisi followed and was impacted by a guy named Jesus and inspired so much love they named Syria. Why is there a San Jose? Well, because there was a man named Joseph, again, whose life was changed by Jesus. Why is there a Sacramento? Because Jesus shared life with people over meals. These were called sacraments, especially the one that we remember called the Last Supper. He laid out a plan and a love so great, it included all people and laid out a path. Why is there an Edmonton? No one knows. There an impact so deep by this one obscure Jewish man who had no office, who had really no power to speak of? Why is his birth the most widely celebrated event nobody can compare and compete with? Why is the instrument of his death, the symbol of the cross, the most famous symbol around the planet that we even use it in our decorations and jewelry? Who was this man? Yaroslav Pelikan says the following, he says, regardless of what anyone may personally think or believe about him, Jesus of Nazareth has been the most dominant figure in the history of Western culture for almost 20 centuries. If it were possible with some sort of super magnet to pull up out of that history every scrap of metal bearing at least a trace of his name, how much would be left? It is from his birth that most of the human race dates its calendars. It is by his name that millions curse, and it is in his name that millions pray. The cursing part's normally on the golf course. Or bowling, or if you're playing Xbox Live like I do. You have to ask, who was this man? Now I want to take the next few minutes and look at Jesus Christ apart from religious affiliation. Okay? 
I mean, this, this, I want to look at this from a historical point of view, the impact that Jesus has had on our society, all culture, okay, for the last 20 centuries. As a man, who is Jesus and what is his impact on the world? Let's take a look at who he is. He's the least likely person who ever changed the world. He was not a politician. He was not from wealth. He had no power, held no office, led no military action, and yet the world knows his name and either curses or prays to it. Everyone knows what Christmas is about to the point of where we put a big X and take Christ out of it. There's something to do with Jesus Christ's name even that this obscure Jewish carpenter historic person has had impact whether it's good or bad. His followers were unschooled, ordinary people, the Bible describes them as. People of unimportance is what they're trying to say. Ordinary men. Yet we can't look at history without thinking about Jesus' impact was this man. Imagine a world without Jesus, without church, no Notre Dame, no St. Paul's Cathedral, no house churches in China, no Peter, no Paul, no Augustine, no Martin Luther, Martin Luther King, Mother Teresa, no Bonhoeffer, Joan of Arc, no John Milton, John Wesley, John Calvin, John the Baptist, no Derwin Clark. In the ancient world, let me paint a picture of what it was like. Classes, race, influence, wealth, and power created divisions. They compartmentalized every single person. This was not something that was done with, with the negative intent. This was normal practice to the point of if you came from a certain bloodline, a certain color of your skin, a certain family name that was attached to you, you had different value and purpose and worth in society. Now, still today, we still have some of this, don't we? But it was much, much worse back then, at least now, which seems to be a hint of moral conflict when we deal with this. Church movement of Christ, the fall of Jesus, of listen to his teachings, was a movement of inclusion, which was completely countercultural, which is something that was never done up until this point in history. I'm talking about full acceptance and inclusion of all people. When scripture said there is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free man, there is neither male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. This changed everything. This was so countercultural to the point where Rome did not like it. It was starting to tear apart their system of influence over the known conquered world. This community did not exist before Christ was a person. Imagine a world based in that practice, in that type of character and action, where people just, without regard, without second thought, place you here, place you here, place you here, depending upon who they think you are and what they think your value is, and that starts to define you. And a place in a world where you don't get to ask questions, have self-discovery, or become more because you're placed here. That is who you are, that's all you'll ever be. Here comes this obscure Jewish man with a ragtag group of 12 people who are saying, no, you're all one, you're all people, because we're in love with God who made us in the Twelve steps came from Jesus' movement. Power for transformation was the influence of Jesus Christ. New Year's Day was inspired by Jesus because the practice was in Israel, they would count eight days from birth of a baby. And on that day, they would take that baby to the temple. And if it was a boy, they would circumcise him. And if it was a girl, they wouldn't, obviously. But then that baby would be given its name. Eight days counted backwards. New Year's, December came, Jesus came into our world to show inclusion, to extend grace, undeserved, unmerited love, and value for all people, not to judge or condemn or destroy, but to give life, love, value, purpose. Who was this man? The ancient world used to date certain events by who governed the current empire. And it was all governed, and it was all dated according to who was the current emperor. Okay, so there was no dates, it was the second year of the world. It only had to do, and no one was in only Caesar. Everyone was always compared to this great semi, what they tried to elevate as a god at their time. It was all in accordance with who he was. It was never who they were. 
until the 6th century monk, Dionysius Exigus, I'm not saying that again, don't ask me, created a calendar to record events no longer based on a pagan myth, Caesar or small g god. It was he who brings value to others. It was based upon the life of Jesus Christ. But this man's purpose was to show and bring value to everyone. The calendar is a means to represent the To say that life is not random, but a story with a beginning and an end. That everyone has a place in that story. Everyone can find their, their, their value, their purpose in that story. Jesus was called Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, this obscure Jewish carpenter. Caesar never heard of. He had 12 followers. Caesar had an empire, the whole known world. Yet, everything is dated according to this Jewish man. Who is it? Isn't it funny that today we name our kids names like Peter, John, Andrew. And we name our dogs names like Nero and Caesar. Who was this man? Again, in the ancient world before Christ, honor, status, rule were divided people. The weak and the marginal were not valued. They were discarded. They were dragged in society and the empire economy. Kids had no sentiment attached to them. Think about that for a second, parents in this room. Your kids did not have the sentiment. They had no value. They were drags upon you. Financially, time, your energy, it wasn't the same love shown to these kids. And this is not something that was wrong. This was the norm. This is socially acceptable. <laughs> it's funny, John Ortberg shares a story when he, uh, he had three kids at the time. They were taking flight from Denver to Colorado. And um, he gets on the plane and these kids are really good, all three of them. He and his wife are tag team and everything's going fine. And then two minutes into the flight, his kids get a switch from like now. They get up out of their seats, they're running around terrorizing, they're pulling snacks in other people's hands, they're running up and down the aisles, and John's sitting there like, <laughs> and his wife's like, they're your kids. Now, I've had the same conversation with my wife, we only have one kid, you know, and she's like, your daughter, I'm like, she pooped, she's both our kids, we both do that, but anyway, so he's chasing his kids all over this plane, and this man storms from the front in a very specific manner to the back, and he's thinking, oh no, Lord, I can't have this conversation right now. My best. I really don't want to knock this guy out in front of a plane from the witnesses. And the guy comes back and says, These are your kids? Yeah, they're my kids. And he picks one of them up. He says, I would give anything to have three kids. John says, Oh, do you not have kids? I've got five kids, but I'd give anything to have three. <laughs> this was not what it was like in the ancient world. Bringing it back down, let me give you an example of what common practice was for children that were unwanted. If unwanted, deformed, or of the unwanted desired gender, and guess what that was back in the day? Female. If you fell into those categories, for every million males, 400,000 girls on average were left to die at birth and exposure. This was common practice. This was socially acceptable. This had no negative value upon it. This was If children were unwanted or deformed or weak, they were drowned, then again, common practice, morally and culturally acceptable. The church, as Jesus said, let the little children come. Beningus of Dijon essentially started the first orphanage when he took in children left to die of exposure and those of failed abortions he raised his own. In fact, he caused such a stirring with this type of practice which was going against the norm in Rome and upset so many people, he was martyred for his actions. Believe that? Widows, by, by practice, were fined by Rome for having the bad taste of surviving their husbands. The church took them in because Jesus said to John, take care of my mother. Common practice back in the day was to throw out the dead and the sick into the streets so they would not infect your family and discard them and cut yourselves off from them. Leave them to die. 
but it was the church who brought in six strangers at the risk of their own health because Jesus cared for the blind, the deaf, the lame, the lepers, and the sick. The first hospital was started in the 4th century by St. Benedict. See, at this point, it was common for monasteries to have hospitals connected to them because they were bringing in all these sick people. They needed a place to put them. At the Geneva Convention, they chose the symbol of a red cross to mark their unified mission to aid in world suffering. Because it was Jesus' character. My wife works in, as a nurse in hospital, helping, aiding, and caring for people because of Jesus Christ, because of the history that the church has done and started, because of Jesus tenderly caring for lives that he had no business caring for if he based his mission on cultural, moral values. This brought about such movements as the YMCA, the Salvation Army, World Vision, and I'm not saying there'd be no compassion without Christ. I know a lot of non-Christians have more compassion than people who call themselves Christ followers. And often his followers fall horribly short of this type of example when we extend our love and our grace and our mercy. And if there is anyone here who has had bad experiences with people who call themselves Christians in the past, I want to say I'm sorry. Please forgive us. Don't let that pain define your relationship and understanding. Let, let there be a new opening, a new journey, and a new experience. See, a lot of times, it's funny, I, I'm so like-minded with Derwin, who is my counterpart, he likes to say that we're co-workers. Really, I, I view him as a mentor. So but we're so connected, even though there's these years that separate us, and there's generational experience that separate us, but we're so like-minded to the point where I really don't care about this type of movement. Let's keep Christ in Christmas. It's like, yeah, but you're always sharing that with the people who don't believe in Jesus to begin with. So I don't, I don't see a connection. I'd rather see Christ kept in Christians than Christ kept in Christmas, okay? The philosopher Mark Nelson writes, if you ask what is Jesus' influence on medicine and compassion, I would suggest that wherever you have an institution of self-giving for the lonely and practical welfare of the lonely, schools, hospitals, hospices, orphanages for those who will never be able to repay, this probably has its roots in the movement of Jesus. Jesus shaped the way we do education today. When he said, love God with all your heart, souls, and minds, further your understanding of who you are. Ask questions like why. Ask questions of things around you, institution. Have this connection with God. Do your study. Have the opportunity to grow as an individual, to walk through life with Christ, to know who you are, who He is in you, who He wants the world to look like in you. Christ's followers devoted their lives to study, not just of Christian works, but of the classics and pagan works as well. In fact, after the sacking of Rome, all literature was destroyed, and history should have been cut off and lost at that point, but it was Christian communities that preserved the great works of ancient literature for future generations with the idea that all truth is God's truth. Universities got this whole start because God created all, one story, including all people. We are all one in Christ, not multiversities, a universe that everyone is included in and allowed to be a part of. It had this whole movement and foundation and the understanding that all were welcome and all were equal and all were blessed and valued and loved. The example of Christ's influence on education. Let me give you an educational model from a great institution that was started in 1692. And let me see if you can guess what it's from. Their motto says, let every student be plainly instructed and earnestly pressed to consider well the main end of his or her life and study is to know God and Jesus Christ, which is eternal life, and therefore to lay Christ as the only foundation of all sound knowledge and learning. That model comes from Harvard University. The people who couldn't afford this type of education went to Alberta Bible College, which makes three of us in this room. The 
acrylic alphabet created in the ninth century by missionary Saint Cyril, along with his brother Methodus, created the first Slavic alphabet by translating the Bible for Slavic people who were viewed less than. The first important name translated into any language is the name Jesus. Who was this man? The Gospels have been translated to more than 2,200 languages. No other book is into one-fifth that many. The movement of Jesus Christ has had an impact on art as we understand it today too, because without Jesus, without the church, there is no Dante's Divine Comedy, which is the primary shaper of Italian. There was no Martin Luther in his Bible, there is no, and he was the primary shaper of modern Germany. There is no King James Bible, the primary shaper of English at the time. There is no Bach, who signed all his works to the glory of God, no Hallelujah Chorus, no Mozart's Requiem. In fact, even modern music notation was created by the church so God could be worshipped through great music that could be spread note for note and recited perfectly as it was its original intent. It's lost its Said, love your enemies. And he prayed for forgiveness of those who were crucifying him at the time of God. He prayed for the forgiveness time and time again. When he was met by Judas, Judas, his betrayer, he greeted him with the term friend. He knew he was friend. And he greeted him with the term friend. Tacticus, who was a writer of martyrs, said, When the great fire in Rome took place and destroyed a majority of the entire city, Emperor Nero's scapegoat was the Christians, the troublemakers, the rebel rousers going against Rome's Pax Romana at the time. And this is what was written by Tacticus. He said, mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. They were covered with the skins of beasts. They were torn apart by dogs and perished. Or they were nailed to crosses. Or they were doomed to be dipped in pitch and lit a flame to be burnt as nightly illumination. The daylight had expired. This went on for three centuries. Torturous, horrible, humiliating, painful deaths. What was the response? For three centuries, what was the response of the church? Their response was not to dream of revenge, assemble an armed resistance, not to take back the culture by force. It was to love the Romans, their enemies. In fact, this, world, this love was so radical that a military commander, three centuries later, refused to kill Christians any longer. He was executed himself because this love was so powerful and changed so the greatest speech in the 20th century given by Martin Luther King starts as a prepared speech and he had written down page by page, word by word. And all of a sudden he felt prompted, I need to go off script, and thank God he did because that's the part that really stood out in the speech was when he had lived because something was happening. He said, I have a dream. That one day every valley shall be exalted and every hill and mountain shall be made low and the rough places will be made plain, and the crooked places will be made straight, and the glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. This is the Jesus dream that he preached for Cain this one say. So in closing, we have the children. He is Jesus. He is the hinge of history. The hope of the oppressed. Inspiration of the dying. King of kings. Lord of lords, the greatest teacher who ever lived, the greatest mind that ever thought. He sparked the greatest movement that ever spread. He is the greatest gift that was ever given. He alone mastered life. He alone conquered death. He alone gave value and inclusion to all people. He alone overcame sin. He is the Son of God. He is the Savior of the world. He seeks after you. He knows you. He loves you. 
That's who Jesus is this Christmas season and every season that follows now. So Lord, we thank you so much. This morning, we thank you. I thank you for your impact. I thank you for the historical records of what you are, who you are, and what you've done to influence the Western culture that I take for granted each and every day. Lord, I thank you for being able to see the comparison of who people were and their practices culturally and morally and how you influence character more. You're not interested in religion. You're not interested in weighing people down with rules and regulations. You're interested at meeting them where they are at in their walk, in their life, in their story. Loving them, showing them grace, unmerited favor, salvation and intimacy and impacting character, Lord God, so that other people may see your love through their actions and who they are and how they think and how they speak. Lord God, let us be let us be a people of Jesus. Let us be a people who love the gospel, who hear the gospel, who soak in the gospel, and spread the gospel. And who we are, what we say, what we believe, Lord, what we do, and our motivation as well. We give you the glory. We thank you for Christmas, Lord. We thank you that you hold us to Lord, we thank you that victory is won. And we're soon going to celebrate that in a short season. So, amen. We're going to have the children come in.